Look at these three words written larger than the rest, with a special pride never written before or since. Tall words proudly saying, we the people. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm excited to be with you guys tonight because we are part of a groundswell that I hope will encompass this entire nation and bring safe, secure elections back to the entire country. So first, a little bit about my organization, the Lex Rex Institute. That's right, Lex Rex is Latin for the law is king because the law is our only king in this country, not Gavin Newsom, certainly not Joe Biden. They are both subject to the law. They are not its master. We're a nonprofit, we're a charitable organization, and our goal is to empower individuals to hold government officials accountable to their sworn duty to uphold, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And importantly, nobody that works at Lex Rex has ever held a job in government. <laughs> There's no conflicts of interest here. We're only fighting against people that we haven't worked for. We are nonpartisan, if you can believe that or not. I think our current client base wouldn't, um, wouldn't make that obvious to people. Uh, but we don't care if the violation of your rights comes from somebody with an R after their name or a D after their name. Either way, we're going to go after them. Uh, we care about the violation of rights of every citizen, even you know, cases that I think other organizations would think might be too small. We are eager to take those cases. Uh, in the, the bio, I think several of the things we did with respect to the COVID-19 mandates were mentioned. That works very important to me. Uh, because that's, you know, those are, those are everyday people. Those are people whose jobs are being threatened by our Leviathan state, and somebody has to do something about it. So even though, you know, it's a little bit outside of the constitutional practice we'd normally do, we stepped up and did something about that, and I'm very proud of that. If we are not a nation of laws, what are we? That's all America is. America is a legal entity. Our Constitution is literally what creates and yes, constitutes our society. If our laws are not upheld, we cease to be a nation. And our Constitution has proudly upheld our nation for the past 246 years. By the grace of God, our Constitution can preserve us for at least 246 more. But that's only if we all defend it. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about tonight, specifically in the arena of elections. Now, there shouldn't be a news flash in stating that manipulation of elections is an old story. Contrary to the chorus of our well-intentioned friends on the left-wing side of the aisle, it's neither new nor is it particularly strange. Rather, electoral irregularity and problems with elections are as old as elections themselves. Just look at the hallowed halls of ancient Athens, which is regarded by many as the birthplace of democracy itself. There, citizens would voice their choices of candidates by casting votes on little shards of pottery called ostraka. I'm sorry if someone's better at Greek than I am. And they were gathered in a large pot and counted by community elders. Importantly, behind closed doors initially, these shards ended up leaving the fate of their democracy in the hands of a select few, rather than of the many. A profound problem lurked in those shadowy corners of this practice. The people's voice in the elite's wishes often sang different songs. And we still don't know to this day whether or not those elections were actually faithfully upholding the people's votes. They may not have been because the people couldn't inspect what was going on. Turn to Rome a few hundred years later. Greece was, I think, 2,500 years ago. Uh, now we're looking at first century BC in Rome. There was actually a practice that ended up being so common they had to create a name for it. And they called it abnutiato. And what that referred to was the practice of, well, you know, they figured timing of elections is always going to be an issue. So what they did is, they, is if somebody wanted to affect the date an election was held, they would talk to the religious seers, or the augurs as they called them, and they would ask the augur, hey, can you act as kind of a weatherman and tell us there's going to be bad omens for the day that election was scheduled? And the augurs would do that. And what ended up happening is they'd wait until political fortunes favored 
the person who wanted to get elected, and suddenly the forecast would magically clear. Now, this is the sort of political maneuvering that very likely delayed Pontifex, Ma the, I'm sorry, the election for Pontifex Maximus when the incumbent preferred a candidate who was not yet old enough to run for office. You might have heard that guy's name. It was Julius Caesar. And let's not forget the many instances of voter intimidation we've seen throughout the years. I think people can talk about that like it's a problem restricted to the U.S. of certain minorities who were intimidated post-Civil War, but it's not new. You know, not that 1860 is new, but it's much older than that even. Try a hundred years earlier. In England, there was sort of a radical candidate by the name of John Wilkes, and there was enough intimidation that he felt that he had to hire 99 men, he called them his Loyalty 99, who would accompany his voters to the polls carrying clubs. <laughs> I'm not sure how his opponent felt about that. And then, of course, there were the instances in the old Soviet Union where they would sort of jimmy and jumble procedures just to tilt the scales a little bit. Uh, one example is a lot of times in many of the elections, if you voted a blank ballot, that ballot was automatically cast for a member of the Communist Party. If you wanted to cast a ballot for anybody else, you had to cross out the name of the communist. You had to write your own candidate underneath it. I'm sure that couldn't be exploited, right? No, it was designed to be exploited. Of course it was. And in response to the sorts of manipulations we've talked about that have been around forever, of course we, we erected safeguards. We declared that ballots would be counted publicly. People would be able to inspect the counts. We fixed specific days for an election that would be the same year after year, you know, second Tuesday in November, whatever it may be. And of course, we birthed the secret ballot to muzzle intimidation. However, we have to keep in mind, perfect immunity from electoral manipulation is not something that we will ever have. Certainly not this side of the eschatological millennium. But the stakes, as high as they are for our elections, the temptation to twist and corrupt practices will always be present. However, what we've seen in recent years, a disturbing trend, has taken place. Unraveling many of these hard-won defenses of centuries past, and for what is perhaps the first time in our long history, rendering the electoral process less secure tomorrow than it was yesterday. I mean, think about that for a second. Our children, if we don't do something, our children may have less secure elections than we do. We've thrown out untold millions, I'm, th I'm sorry, thrown untold millions of dollars at a nebulous network of software engineers. We just heard all about how much this is costing us. Software engineers, hardware manufacturers, other middlemen who have woven a complex, often opaque tapestry of voting machines while their coffers swell. They tell us that this is the price that we must pay for progress for accuracy, for efficiency. But we have to ask ourselves, are these dollars the only price that we're paying? I don't think they are. Now, imagine you're voting on one of these uh, contemporary voting machines. Picture the journey of a single vote, which you feed into the maw of one of these machines. It enters as a tangible act. Hopefully something in paper, you know, that you marked with pen, but it could be a flick of a switch, could be a tap of a screen. Either way, it's a human action that was taken to vote that ballot. What happens after that? Well, it morphs into an electronic pulse, a line of code, a digital specter. We have no access to the source code that these machines use when tabulating votes. Instead, we must trust the company that made those machines and the men who programmed those machines. Now, in a disturbing twist, suddenly we've returned to the days of the Greek a democracy or the Roman Republic, where counts were conducted behind closed doors and you had to trust the people who were conducting them. We've handed trust, in the instance of the Greeks, over to a group of people, and today, over to a company, hoping that they get it right. Now, in a sense, of course, every vote cast in any election is always an act of faith. Faith in our democracy, faith in our nation, faith in our future. But we don't want it to be faith in a man, or in a machine? How can we maintain faith when our votes disappear into an enigmatic machine as inscrutable as the Sphinx and as unaccountable as Shadow? We have, with this leap into the future, 
unwittingly unraveled the protections won through centuries of hard-fought battles. We have, and this is not an exaggeration, we have traded our literal birthright, which is free and fair elections, for the equivalent of a bowl of soup. By discarding same-day voting, we unwittingly retraced the steps of the Romans. Remember, they would change election, they'd change election days based on who was likely to win on those days. And that's the very same steps that brought them a dictator who collapsed their republic, because that's what Julius Caesar did. That was the end of the Roman Republic. It was done after that. By altering the electoral procedures and endorsing a plethora of non-secure methods, we are playing a dangerous game that the Soviet Union knew all too well. The problem with these changes to electoral process is not that they are inherently corrupt. I want to be very clear about that. Now, they may be, and I'm sure that you've heard a lot in the past, and I know we heard a lot today, showing that these processes themselves are in fact corrupt, but even if they weren't, the problem is they are inherently corruptible. These machines are programmed by either it's inserting a USB flash drive or an SD card, something that has software on it. If somebody interferes with that software, you have election tampering on a grand scale. You end up prying open the floodgates, welcoming those with a nefarious intent to tinker with our elections. Now in the past, these damages were relatively limited because one person could only wreak so much harm. You know, you can only stuff so many ballots before somebody catches that you're doing that. And you, beyond that, you have to hire more people to make it possible. Now, with the same software installed on every machine in a particular jurisdiction, one act of tampering can affect the results of the entire election. And on top of that, because the, the machines are not open source in their software, it's all the more difficult to detect. Now, I'm not here today simply to rehash the problems that I'm sure most of you are all too familiar with. These problems aren't new. In fact, these problems are specters of our past, specters that we have vanquished time and again. This history provides us not just with cautionary tales, but it actually provides us with examples, and it provides us with a beacon of hope, because the knowledge that we get from history is that these issues are not insurmountable. They've been fixed before, they can fix again. We can conquer our elections once more. So how do we do that? That's the real question, right? Well, I think Shasta County gives us one way. Earlier this year, Shasta made what some are calling an audacious decision to sever ties with Dominion, canceling their contract, and turning their back on the nebulous world of electronic tabulation. They embraced instead an age-old tradition. 100% manual counting of paper ballots. Now, I'm, I'm proud to say that I played a small part in making that happen, and we're continuing to support them through this process. And since the day they made that decision, I, somehow people got wind of the fact that I was involved, and my office's phones haven't stopped ringing off the hook. Concerned citizens from counties across the country and across the state, across the entire nation, have been contacting us to ask how they can do the same thing for their county and follow in Shasta's footsteps, and we are glad to help them do that. In fact, one such call is the reason why I'm here today. Now, as a lawyer, my commitment is not merely to legalities, but to the constitution of our republic, the very animating spirit of our society. The winds of change are blowing strong, carrying with them the seeds of resurgent political momentum, and counties across our great nation are at different stages in this journey, each navigating its own unique path towards securing their elections. The form this engagement takes will be dictated by the stage of the process in which that county finds itself. It may involve encouraging open forums for discussion, maybe attending county board meetings. Sounds like you guys have done a lot of that. You probably have way more experience than I do on that. Uh, raising awareness about voting procedures or directly meeting with members of your board. Lots of other things you can do. Now, these are not mere suggestions. They are fundamental responsibilities incumbent upon us as citizens. And we'll talk more about where Orange County is in that process in a minute or two. But just as a commander in an army adjusts his strategies to counter to, to the contours of whatever a battlefield may be, so too must we adapt our approaches and strategies to the unique situations we face in our counties. The strategy that works in one county may not work in another. We must be willing to learn, to adapt, and above all, to persevere. We're here, 
My organization is here to help you do that. To aid you in this quest, we've been distributing, well, to start with, an informative article, sort of a roadmap for each county to assess their position and to chart their course and how far this is going. Um, I think we have copies of that at the back. Kristen's nodding her head. Uh, so we can get you guys copies of that. I see some people holding them up. Um, but that's great. So that sort of shows us where you are. It can gauge what the progress is going to look like, where we're coming from, where we're going. And of course, the Lex Rex Institute has been offering guidance and support to concerned citizens and members of county boards of supervisors to make this program happening. And we've been doing it completely free of charge. Now, we are a 501c3 nonprofit charity, so we can only do this work with your contributions, and they are very much appreciated. But seeking to allay some of the concerns and perhaps spare my phone lines a little bit, I want to take the opportunity to dispel some of the common myths that tend to surface in the conversations that I've been having about this switch. So I think we said earlier, Lex Rex Institute's obviously dedicated to holding government officials accountable. And probably the most common trend that we've noticed in doing this is that government officials don't really like being held accountable. <laughs> and, and they'll usually try to sidestep accountability in some way. And I've found the most common way they do that tends to be by saying, oh, I don't have any power over this. That somebody else has the power over this. We can't do anything about it. You know, often when grassroots movements are championing election integrity, these kinds of claims come either from the Board of Supervisors or from the Registrar of Voters. They might point fingers at each other, they might point fingers at the Secretary of State. Either way, somebody else always has the power, right? So we gotta clear that up. Well, let me assure you, while their power over elections may not be absolute, the power of County Board of Supervisors is far from insignificant most things they do have control over. Now, regrettably, when these officials tell you they can't do something, they may be distorting the truth. Like, they may just be lying to you. That's possible. But more likely, they've actually been misled, either by county attorneys or by other bureaucrats who have told them they have no power over this because they don't want their job to get harder if the Board of Supervisors changes their directive on something. Now, if your county asserts that its hands are tied, please don't take their word as gospel. Do your own research, and if that proves daunting, we can do it for you. Now, regarding specific claims that I've heard County Board of Supervisors make in California, firstly, let me state emphatically and without any equivocation, there is no provision in California or federal law that prohibits a County Board of Supervisors from implementing a manual count procedure. None. In fact, I think it's actually fair to say the California Elections Code prefers hand counting because it's the system that's used to verify whether or not counts are accurate, and it's the system that's used for recounts. So if somebody tells you that somehow it's a worse system or that California doesn't approve of it, that is just not true. It's either a lie or they are sorely misled. Some counties may feel constrained by issues due to specific objectives. Or actually, before that, I know one that's of import to you guys is going to be the Voter Rights Act because your county's opted to adopt certain provisions of that. It's important to keep in mind, Voter Rights Act, this was stated earlier, but I just want to reiterate it, does not obligate counties to allow voters to cast their ballots at any polling station within that county. They're not obligated to do that. What the act does do is simplify the process for counties to facilitate mail-in voting. And if a county establishes mail-in voting procedures that are in the act, then they have to have the polling center scheme that's worked out. If they don't do that, there's no requirement that falls upon them. And what it did was it established stipulations that come into play when a county opts for an all-mail-in election. Obviously, I don't think you guys want that. So none of those restrictions apply. In such cases, counties are mandated to adopt new vote center models, but outside those cases, they're not. Now, some counties may feel constrained. This, when I say counties, I mean the Board of Supervisors here. 
may feel constrained by this issue due to specific objectives they believe can only be accomplished by following the path laid out by the Voters' Rights Act. It's entirely possible. However, I can assure you that it is also entirely possible that their goals can be realized through alternative means. Often, county attorneys who are unfamiliar with these alternatives tend to gravitate toward the path of least resistance, which coincidentally turns out to be the agenda that's been vigorously promoted by the Secretary of State. But that's why you need support from you know, people who are not beholden to government, and we're ready to stand with you, eager to steer them towards these different alternative solutions. We believe that by unearthing these alternatives, we can foster a more secure, transparent, and resilient electoral process that truly honors the principles of our republic. Which brings us to Orange County. You guys know that you have a reputation throughout the country, right? I, I can go to Washington, D.C., I can go anywhere in the country, and everybody knows who Orange County is. And they are a famously conservative county. I mean, it's, it's known throughout the country as that. And, you know, true to your roots, you guys are doing a great job. I mean, I was really impressed by the stuff I was hearing earlier tonight. Uh, the amount of activism at board meetings that you guys have, and the sheer number of, and um, you know, not just number, but the strategic approach of how you guys are tackling these issues is, is among the best I've ever seen. Um, I would be really, yeah, no, seriously, give you guys a round of applause. Give yourselves that. But don't let up. Shasta has lit the torch, they have rung the bell, and they are calling for aid. Either you can stand with them, or they can stand alone. And if they stand alone, you know, I can tell you, it doesn't really matter how strong their legal footing is. The state of California has a lot of power. But if they stand with other counties who are doing the same thing, there is very little that anybody can do to stop it. So you guys have the momentum, ride that momentum. And that's going to involve, I, you know, I guess you guys have already been going to the meeting, so next step is going to involve talking one-on-one -on -one with your supervisors, see if they have objections, seeing what they are. You know, maybe, maybe they would be open to the idea of exploring the options that you're looking at. That's a foot in the door at least. And at that point you learn who's opposed to you, and you can do more targeted approaches at that point. The solution I'm proposing here is not a revolutionary one. It's as old as democracy itself. Manual counting conducted transparently and overseen by representatives from all parties is a system that anyone can understand and appreciate. It's a system that places the process of democracy directly in the hands of the people rather than the circuits of a machine. Now, some might argue it's a step backwards, that it's slower or less efficient. But since when is democracy about speed and efficiency? I thought dictatorships were for that. No, democracy is about ensuring that every voice is heard, that every vote is counted, and that every citizen, yes, citizen, can trust in the process. So that's the first way. That's community activism, community action is the first and most important way to get this done. Second way is the way that I tend to come in, which is in the courts. That's gonna be important too, because somebody's gotta clean things up when it doesn't go right. And that's what you know, my colleagues today are actually doing today in Arizona in Carrie Lake's case, which was the case that I worked on directly. <laughs> it's what we've done in a lot of cases. So you know, if you're not a lawyer, I know there's some other lawyers in the room, but if you're not a lawyer, believe it or not, you can help out with these two. The way that you do that is you poll watch. Poll watch, public records requests, so general things that can keep people accountable. Poll watching is extremely important. Remember that ancient Greek example of when nobody watched the polls? We don't have that here. Here we have a right to access every stage of the vote count, and we need to be there. You know, if, if you can't stay up late, get somebody to tag team it with you, but we need to make sure that eyes are on those elections, because if they aren't, then when these cases do go to trial, we don't have any of the evidence we need. We need to be collecting this evidence to make sure that it's all there, it's all lined up, it's all properly categorized, properly organized, so that when the attorneys bring these challenges, we can just go boom, 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 boom. Here are all the points we need to make, here's all the evidence to back it up, here are the people with sworn affidavits, you can talk to them if you want to. Believe me, that'd make our job a whole heck of a lot easier. <laughs> so I know it can feel futile to poll watch, believe me, it is not. 
that is integral information for election challenges. I know some people give contrary advice on that, but that's, I think it's extremely important. And the other thing is gonna be public records requests for the same reason. We can do discovery during these election challenges, but because they almost always have to be brought after election day and before the candidates are sworn in, we have a very short timetable on these challenges, so we don't have time to conduct the ordinary discovery that you would in a lawsuit. We have to rely on evidence that's already there. We, we actually, we learned that in Kerry Lake's case. It wasn't the first time we learned it, but it's, it comes up in every election case where you have a lot of evidence, certainly, but the, the most crucial evidence, the most important evidence, these counties just drag their heels on giving you. So if somebody in that county, a concerned citizen, already has the evidence, they've already organized it, already highlighted the relevant parts, and they can just hand it to you, believe me, that is invaluable. You will be doing, you will be doing your country a service that you, know, is <laughs> that you can be proud of to your grandchildren and that your grandchildren can be proud of to their grandchildren. It's, I can't stress the importance of that. The time has come to reaffirm our commitment to a democratic process that is of the people, by the people, and most importantly, verifiable by the people. The time has come to choose a path that respects the dignity of every voter and the sanctity of every lawfully cast vote. In the end, it's not just about counting votes, it's about making every lawful vote count. And there is no machine no technology, no algorithm that can do that better than we can. Thank you.